So um, many of you remember um, seeing lots of familiar faces. Uh, this was, doesn't feel like too long ago, but in February 2022, uh, I began a series on sanctification. And uh, in my mind, it made sense to just walk slowly and methodically through that oh so important biblical doctrine. And I've, I've still got plans to teach everything that I have in that notes app on my phone, uh, but it just won't be here. Uh, that, that started back in February, 2022. And we ended up covering uh, 16 lessons that year and then as we got closer to departing for New Orleans uh, and, and my role here started to shift and lessen a little bit and how much I was carrying, uh, that series, this series, uh, won't be finished here. But I ended up teaching the, the, the final one that's available online, the part 17, ended up being a book review almost a year exactly from, from today. So it was a year ago uh, on May 21st uh, last year. And really the, the reason I even had that on my heart to teach is because as I was discipling the members here and teaching in various capacities and counseling a bunch the, there seemed to appear a recurring theme, and that is that many of the people who were a part of this church or looking to be a part of this church, uh, there was an unfortunate confusion about how to take the things that I was learning, that we were learning and being taught uh, here from the pulpit and in small group and in build and wellspring and the various ministries in this church and how to practically apply them and, and make my life change, how to make my heart, thoughts, desires, habits all turn Godward and how to practically cause myself to look more like Jesus. Uh, you know, as I just asked instance after instance, you know, what have you done about what we're talking about? What have you tried? Uh, how are you applying God's word? I mean, the, the answers seem to always be, well, I'm reading my Bible, or I'm, I'm praying, or I'm serving or involved in the church in this capacity or that capacity. But how those very good things ought to have resulted and tangible differences in life, in a marriage, in parenting, in some personal sin struggle, uh, we had just seemed to be missing that. <laughs> and so I thought to just work through uh, in a practical way for our church, how to think about personal change is, is what we need. And uh, I came far short of, of, of finishing that. <laughs> but um, that's, that was the initial impetus for uh, this, this study that I was teaching here. And um, really, the, the next thing that I had in mind uh, was to address purity of heart, to address the inner life, and over several lessons to help us think about what we call heart shepherding, and the practical side of the building Wellspring Ministries, how do we actually think about and, and apply those things that we're learning? How do we think about the heart? And just to take some old teachings and maybe give us, give us a fresh look on those things and to do that over several lessons. Well, I'm not going to be here for several more lessons, so we're just going to condense all of that into one morning this morning and talk about purity of heart, purity of heart. So this will be part 18 of sanctification, and we're going to look at purity of heart. Uh, John Calvin, when he was exiled, essentially kicked out of Geneva 
for his shepherding practices and what he was teaching. He was gone for three years. And when he finally returned three years later, he picked up right back in the Psalms where he had left off. Uh, this isn't quite that, but it's got precedence in, in church history uh, to, to pick back up after a, a long break anyway. And so I want to talk about purity of heart uh, and just want us to think about this morning as we think about purity of heart and how it's essential really to the Christian life uh, that this purity of heart is actually the goal of biblical instruction. It's a characteristic of all those who will one day inherit God's kingdom where they'll see God face to face. Uh, and unfortunately, purity of heart has kind of fallen on hard times. And this isn't the, the common way of thinking that purity of heart is actually necessary. It's uh, not something we can do without in the Christian life. We must have this. Uh, and and we, our souls are not safe, you could say, without purity of heart. Really what, what seems to be more common in Christian literature specifically that has to do with this doctrine of sanctification and Christian growth, what's more common is what we might call a forfeiture of holiness, a forfeiture of holiness, that true holiness is really far too easily forfeited for some lesser standard of morality that seems more attainable to us. And this is really the attitude that Perhaps even you've seen in, in folks you know, maybe you've fallen prey to this way of thinking. It's a, a way of just giving up on God's standard of holiness for us. And we give up, we wave the white flag and just forfeit the fight altogether. <laughs> Tap out, I'm done. That standard of holiness, whatever it is, in my home, in my marriage, personally, in my heart, is just too hard? Have you ever been reading the Bible and you've just come across a command or uh, some commendable example and you've just subtly perhaps thought to yourself, yeah, I, I could never do that. Yeah, that's not going to happen. And so you, you excuse yourself from obeying or striving for the biblical ideal, the biblical command that's being required in whatever you've been reading or hearing and just saying, I can't do that, but maybe this level of purity, maybe this level of holiness, I'll strive for that instead. I've been there at times. It's a, a subtle deception that our hearts can embrace when we just tell ourselves upon reading something that God has required, that's too hard. <clears throat> Think of some of these examples, uh, what we do with a, a requirement like patience, and we settle for impatience and think, I'll never not be angry when fill-in-the-blank happens. And it doesn't even occur to us almost that, you know what, I can choose to not be angry, and I actually need to strive to not be angry, and whatever truth it takes to be more patient, I need to start laying hold of that truth, applying that truth, and practicing not being angry. To be annoyed, to have an outburst of anger, to be rude, to be uh, impatient and intolerant of others around me in some way, that's actually grievous sin to the Lord that I must put off for the sake of my own soul. And if you go back and listen to my uh, few lessons I taught on practical atheism, you can make the connection. I was angry in that moment and rude in the way I spoke to my spouse. What that was deep down was the seeds of apostasy in me, choosing to not believe something that God has said, thinking I know better than God. Where God says a soft word turns away wrath, I said, nah, uh-uh, uh-uh, God. Actually, 
What's wiser in this moment is not to be slow to anger, but the folly of being hasty and running toward anger is better in this moment. I know better than you. That's the seeds of apostasy. Because where does that stop? That kind of thinking, that kind of subtle deception in the heart, unchecked, where does that go? God, when you say, I have no righteousness of my own, and the only way I can be made right with you is through faith in a sinless substitute, Jesus Christ, who endured your wrath on the cross, people who reject that, you know what they say? Uh Uh-uh. No, God, I know better. The same thing we said in our heart when we were impatient. We have to learn to make the connection. And you could add dozens, hundreds of other sins to that list. The way we tell God his standards too high and unattainable, and we create fashion, (laughs) our own idols, some God or standard of morality that we're able to please. And we say, you know what, God, your standard for sexual purity and when it comes to lust is unattainable, let me fashion something that I can actually attain to. Or anxiety. Be anxious for nothing. That's kind of a lot. Nothing, nothing at all. So I'm going to actually pick out just a couple things and say, my anxiety is justified in these few circumstances and all the rest. You could certainly add to this. And, 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 and just to, to say this, perhaps you are hearing this and uh, you're someone who's sort of thrown in the towel on becoming an exemplary disciple in this church to say no one's looking to me to be to to follow my faith and I kind of like it that way or I don't think I'll ever be exemplary enough to follow I actually prefer people not to look to me and so you've just given up on being exemplary before the Lord even young people you in student ministries. Oh, I, could never, I could never be exemplary, worthy of being followed. Everyone's older than me. They've got this. They don't, they don't need my example. That's just, that's not true. <laughs> you did not open your Bible and read that anywhere. <laughs> so you made that up, young people. <laughs> you, should, you should look to 1 Timothy 4.12. Don't let anyone despise your youth. And how can you control that? He says, be an example to the saints. And he gives us a list. Speech, conduct, love, faith, purity. I came across an unfortunate example of of this mindset, even in a, a popular book on sanctification titled Deeper. In, in that book, the author writes this, and this is a manual on sanctification, and he says, regarding the purpose why he's writing and the audience to whom he's writing, he says, quote, we're talking about real change, and we're talking about real change for real sinners. And he tells his audience this, his readers, if you confess the doctrine of original sin, but at the same time, feel yourself to be doing pretty well as a Christian, you can put this book back on the shelf. That's interesting. Are you saying I can't believe what the Bible says about sin and be doing pretty well as a, as a believer? Oh, no. <laughs> Is my life just supposed to be a, a, a wreck while I believe what the Bible says about sin? Can I not do what Paul commands and walk in a manner worthy of the Lord as I'm striving for that and say, but I am like Paul, the chief of all sinners. Of course, but that's not the the attitude of too many 
Christians today and, and authors who are writing books like this one is no Christians who are honest, their lives are a mess. And I just don't believe that that's the case. <laughs> I don't believe that that's the case. You can be arrogant and proud thinking that you're doing well. And that's not what I'm encouraging at all. But you can actually live a consistent, blameless, holy life. Not perfect, but consistent and upright and blameless. That's attainable. And God calls us to that. And if we have that way of thinking, there's one thing that we are sure to never achieve, to never uh, really practice, and that is what we're talking about this morning, this morning, purity of heart. If you give up in the ways that I've just described, then you'll never have a pure heart. And so let me begin with that encouragement. Reset your focus this morning. Whatever baggage you brought to equipping hour, however your week went, whatever sin struggles you're aware of this morning, just know God's word provides a path forward. You don't have to be stuck in the rut you might be stuck in. The scriptures give us sufficient hope and sufficient help. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. I want to tackle this issue of purity of heart with really four questions four questions concerning purity of heart. I'll give them to you all up front. We're going to answer the questions, what is it? What is it? Is it possible? Is it necessary? And how is it accomplished? Number one, what is it? Number two, is it possible? Number three, is it necessary? And finally, number four, is purity, how is purity of heart accomplished. <clears throat> John Flavel was right when he noted that the heart is, of man, the heart of man is the, his worst part before it be regenerate, and the best afterwards. <laughs> before you were a believer, your heart was the worst thing about you. And now that God has saved you, Christian, it's the best part about you the best part about you. And he goes on to say, the eye of God is, and the eye of the Christian ought to be, principally fixed upon the heart. This is the emphasis in Scripture is the heart. We're not talking about behavior modifications. We're not talking about just following some formula for personal change. We're not talking about just going through the steps rotely. <laughs> but from the inside out, at the level of your convictions, what you believe, what you love, what you're motivated by, where only God himself can see, that must, must change. That must change and be brought into submission to the truth. So with these four questions in mind, let's look at number one. What is purity of heart? What is purity of heart? Turn to Proverbs chapter 14, verse 4. This word for pure that we're going to see, the Hebrew word bar, bar means pure or empty. And it appears in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 4 which says, where no oxen are, the manger is bar, clean, pure, empty, but much revenue comes by the strength of the ox. You get what that means? You can have money that comes from using the ox's strength to accomplish a task that only the ox's strength can, can accomplish, but with that comes what? All of the filth that oxens, that come with oxen and managing them and keeping them. 
but you could have no oxen, forego the revenue, and what will you have instead? Well, a clean manger, a pure manger, nothing in it to defile. And so that's one place where this word for pure appears. Turn, to pro, uh, turn back to Psalm 24. Psalm 24. And just look at verse 3 as David in this psalm describes Yahweh the creator, Yahweh the savior, Yahweh the king who is coming. He says in Psalm 24 verse 3, who may ascend into the, the mountain of Yahweh and who may rise in his holy place? Answer, he who has innocent hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul to worthlessness and has not sworn deceitfully, he shall lift up a blessing from Yahweh and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, literally Jacob, <laughs> Selah. That word pure, you see it in verse four, uh, and there the whole phrase that we're discussing is here a pure heart. Literally, when he answers the question, who will ascend the mountain and rise in his holy place? Literally, innocent hands and a pure heart is how the answer begins. Now, some have taken this description uh, and suggested that, well, innocent hands, a pure heart, doesn't lift up his soul to worthlessness and, and has not sworn deceitfully. That sounds an awful light like Jesus. Those are pretty high standards of holiness. So the answer to the question, who will ascend the hill or ascend the mountain and stand in the holy place? Only, only Christ, only the Messiah. There you go. There's your answer. We, none of us can be this. It's only Jesus. And, and let me just say that's not, I believe, the proper way to interpret this song, this, this uh, psalm that David is writing. And it's not a, a reference to Christ just briefly for a few reasons, uh, because Christ, theologically, is Yahweh, the King of glory. Just look at verse 7. Calls for the, the gates and the ancient doors to move out of the way. Why? Because the King of glory is coming in. Let him come in. Who is this king of glory? Verse 8. He is Yahweh, strong and mighty. Yahweh, mighty in battle. And then it's repeated in verses 9 and 10. So Yahweh himself is the king. Note in verse 3, it's his mountain. It's his holy place that needs to be gotten into. And so just contextually, even, even he, if we back up in verse 1, he's the creator. He's the, the one to whom the earth and all its fullness belong because he made it. So if you suddenly say in the middle of this psalm, the only one who can go into Yahweh's hill is Yahweh, it kind of defeats the purpose of the question being answered. He could have just said nobody can go to Yahweh's hill, and that would have been sufficient, but he doesn't. He actually gives a description of a person. Uh, another reason is because the answer to the question in verse 3 references a generation in verse 6 and calls that group being described, or the person in group, who's a part, the people part of that group being described, the generation of those who seek him. This is the generation of those who seek him. So he's talking about a group of actual people being described there. And then another reason I think it's an error to take this as Christ uh, being described is because finally, uh, everything listed describes the holiness that God intends for his people to come to possess. Uh, and even grammatically, this is in the present, uh, is how that's to be taken. So it's the, the one who, verse 4, has innocent hands, has a pure heart, doesn't currently lift up his soul to worthlessness, and doesn't currently swear deceitfully, is the idea. It's just describing a kind of person. And these things are true of him in the present. And so when it says in verse 4 that this one has 
innocent hands and a pure heart, uh, that word for pure or empty simply means something similar as what it meant in what we saw in Proverbs 14.4. It means in the sense that it's pure, it's empty, such that it's lacking anything that might defile or, or, or soil something. It's lacking impurities. Um, there's a lack of what would cause impurity. And that's what's, what's in mind when it describes a pure heart. It's not describing absolute perfection, but rather a genuine blamelessness at the inner life level. It's consistency, really, of holy living. It's describing a, a pattern of upright living, both internally at the heart level, and if you include the innocent hands description, that's targeting the outer life. And so we're called to this uh, as believers. The God's people in the Old Testament were called to this as well. And just note this, you didn't, you didn't obtain these things instantaneously when you believe the gospel, right, Christian? You didn't all of a sudden go from a God-hating, reprobate sinner to being perfectly or genuinely, thoroughly cleansed of, of your sins. You still had stuff to get out of your life. You still had to learn God and go, oh man, I need to actually bring my life into submission to what else God's word says beyond faith in the gospel. And so purity of heart is not uh, a gospel reality in the sense that it's instantaneous and comes with justification, but it actually requires striving to not swear deceitfully. You have to actually strive toward that. And you could even write down Psalm 15 for a parallel passage with a similar description. It's just describing a holy life, the holy life that all God's believers have pursued really for all time. And so really we can think of uh, purity of heart. What is it? Really you can think of it this way. It's purity of heart is what results from a constant, regular, successful removal of sin from the soul. Say that again. Purity of heart is the result of constant, regular, successful removal of sin from the soul. This isn't news to you if you've been here for, for very long. This is heart shepherding. It's what happens when you shepherd your heart. When you bring everything your heart does, its thinking, its beliefs, its convictions, its desires, the motivations that are at the center of you, i.e. your heart, when you bring all of that in subjection to specific truth that God has spoken in his word, what, what results from a life habitually practicing that? Purity of heart. That's right. Purity of heart. Even in your imperfection. <laughs> You have purity of heart as the result is what we're talking about. And so question number two, now that we've seen what is it, is this, is it possible to consistently, regularly, successfully remove sin from my own soul? Question number two, is purity of heart possible? And the answer is yes, it is possible. Psalm 24 already gives us an answer in one sense. He who has innocent hands and a pure heart. This is the generation of those who seek Yahweh. They seek Yahweh's face. <laughs> is it possible? Yes. There's a generation, a specific group of people uh, associated with a certain age or time when I think these things will ultimately be manifest, where the psalm ends up going. Yes, when the king is finally 
seated on his throne as the, the one who has conquered and removed evildoers and finally si- seated on David's throne, that generation of those who seek you, they possess a pure heart. They were characterized in this life by a pure heart. Is it possible? Yes. Uh, fast forward to Psalm 73. We get another helpful instance of this phrase occurring not by David but Asaph one of David's songwriter seers and in verse 1 a psalm of Asaph Psalm 73 verse 1 surely I love the way this is worded good to Israel is God literally Surely good to Israel is God. (laughs) To the pure of heart is who he has in mind when he says Israel. And so Asaph has a category of actual Israel within Israel, true Israel, as Paul calls it in the New Testament. All of Israel, not of Israel, but Who does Asaph have in mind? He's good to Israel, i.e. those who are pure in heart. How's that for motivation to pursue purity of heart? You want to experience the goodness of God? Be, Be pure of heart. Pursue purity of heart. God's good to those people in a way that is unique, in a way that is not simply what we call common grace, (laughs) that he lets it rain on the just and the unjust, but uniquely good, kind, favorable towards them. One more passage. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. And answering this question is, Is purity of heart even possible? Sounds kind of hard. Paul seems to think so. Tells Timothy, there's a whole group of people with it. Go befriend them. Look what he says in verse 22 of 2 Timothy 2. Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue this, righteousness, faith, Love, peace, by yourself. No. What does he say? With those who call on the Lord from a what? Pure heart. There's a whole group of people, Timothy, who worship God pure of heartedly. <laughs> And, and go pursue these things. You don't just have practical righteousness, ongoing faith, constant love, transcendent peace with no effort. Because if he did, he wouldn't have to tell Timothy to pursue those things. There's some striving involved. And so pursue those things, but don't do it alone. Do it with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Other people who do what? They shepherd their hearts. They're sincere. They're constant. They're faithful. They're diligent. They're watchful. Let your strivings be locking arms with those people. So is it possible? Absolutely it's possible. You know, if, if, if you young people still living in your parents' home, if, if one of your parents had to tell a sibling of yours or a friend of yours what Paul is telling Timothy. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with... Would your name come to mind? My son or daughter practices heart shepherding. They're just... They might still be uh, at the mercy of their own youthfulness in one sense and they just need to mature and keep walking with the Lord, but they are faithful even at a young age. This other young person, 
I want you to befriend my son or daughter because they can help you. Would your name come to mind? We should hope. Husbands, if your wife heard about some other husband in the church who's struggling, would she think, that guy needs to get with my husband because he's doing it. He can get him straight. He needs to just come into our home, that, that husband with his family, and just watch my husband around the dinner table. And he will see good heart shepherding, good home shepherding. And same things with you wives. Would you come to mind if your husband knew of a woman who needed help submitting to her husband with joy, honoring her husband, respecting her husband? Would he say, let me pass along my wife's phone number, shoot her a text. She, she's going to be a tremendous resource for you. We should strive for these things, right? Thinking about you singles. Man, this, this young lady has walked the path of singleness so well. And there's someone else struggling with contentment. Let me just connect y'all. And I know that person who's struggling is going to be so benefited by a friendship with this, with this person because I'm so encouraged. I can see her contentment. Purity of heart is going to show in your life. You, you won't have to tell people, I've got a pure heart. <laughs> Send people my way. I'm ready to disciple someone. You won't have to say that. Why? You will not be able to, to shut the, the floodgates on the people coming your way <laughs> because people will be so evidently encouraged by your life. They're going to they're gonna send people your way, and you should be looking to do that, you know? You don't have time to get with that person, or you just need to, to spread the, the discipleship responsibilities because you're getting lots of people, and you want to send people other people's way. Aim to be someone that's going to come to mind just by being faithful in the little things, in, in, the, in the privacy of your own soul. And so we want to consider, thirdly, is it, is it necessary I mean, it's, it's one thing to say, okay, we get what it is and we get it's attainable, but what's really at stake? Do we have to have that? And I just want to give you a couple things, a couple reasons why this is necessary. It's necessary, this purity of heart that we're talking about is necessary for clarity and for the kingdom. Is necessary for clarity and for the kingdom. Let me show you this in one place. Go to Psalm 19. Psalm 19, a famous song about the supremacy of God's word revealed. And here we have this bar, pure, pure word again, appearing in. In Psalm 19, now it's not talking about the heart, though. It's talking about God's own word. It's pure. Look at this in verse 8. The precepts of Yahweh are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yahweh is pure, doing something, enlightening the eyes. Enlightening the eyes. Is purity of heart necessary? Yes, yes. It is necessary for clarity. Purity is necessary for clarity. And before we think about the purity of heart, and we'll get here, how can I practically have a purity of heart, obtain, attain a purity of heart, and then maintain purity of heart? It has to start with something outside of myself, something purer, if you will, than my heart. And that is the perfectly pure word of God. The commandment of Yahweh is this. It is pure in a way that your heart can't be this side of heaven even. It is pure. It has no blemishes whatsoever. 
it's flawless. Every word is right. Every word is good. Every word is true. Every commandment is just. It is pure. There is nothing in it to obscure its clarity. There's nothing in it to defile it. There's nothing in it to raise an accusation of fault. It's pure. It's pure. And what does the flawless word of God accomplish now in us, in the one who, who believingly looks into it? It enlightens the eyes. It grants clarity. God's word is so clear. It makes clear the one who believes it is the idea. It's so clear. It's so pure that it will purify you, Christian. So do you need it? Is, it? is purity of heart necessary? Yes, purity of heart is necessary. The, word of, the pure word of God has to purify you so you can have your eyes enlightened. It's absolutely necessary for clarity. Isn't it amazing? God has required something outside of us to improve us. <laughs> You're not dependent on yourself. You're not dependent on yourself to get this. Purity of heart cannot be attained if you rely on your own resources. Then depend on us. Praise God. But this purity of heart is also necessary for the kingdom. Fast forward all the way to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. I love this. This is a sort of a, if you want to call it this, silver bullet on this issue <laughs> theology of purity of heart, you can get it in a word in the Sermon on the Mount. Verse 8 of Matthew 5, blessed is somebody, and who is blessed? The pure in heart, for they shall see God. There's so much here, and we don't have time to unpack this at length, but Blessed are the pure in heart. Uh, Psalm 24, this should sound familiar, what we're reading here, because we just read, they will raise up a blessing to the God of their salvation. That was Psalm 24. The one who has a pure heart will lift up, raise up a blessing to the God of his salvation. I think ultimate salvation is in view there in Psalm 24, Ultimate salvation is in view here in Matthew 5. This is capital S salvation, capital K kingdom blessings that are in mind. Because you'll notice in all of these beatitudes, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. The group is identified and, it, and it's, they possess something now that they don't actually have tangibly. Verse 3, the kingdom of heaven. And then everything else is future. They shall be comforted. Well, that's when that blessing that he just mentioned of the kingdom is finally manifest. Verse 5, they shall inherit the, I think, gase, better translated, land. They shall inherit the land when that kingdom finally comes. They shall be satisfied when the kingdom finally is manifest. They shall receive ultimate mercy when the king, in the kingdom. They shall see God at the same time. They shall be called sons of God. And then he ends it. They, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I mean, he's talking about the kingdom. Who inherits the kingdom? The pure in heart. Is, is purity of heart really necessary? Absolutely. You can bank your eternity on it. It's necessary. What in the world would make someone think who hates purity of heart now, who doesn't even strive for purity of heart now, that somehow they would actually enjoy the kingdom where everything's pure and everybody else has pure hearts, perfectly pure hearts. You don't want that now and you think you're going to like heaven? You're mistaken. It's just not so. The kingdom belongs to those who pursue purity of heart now, who experience purity of heart now. 
And listen, we're all on a spectrum to some degree or another. I might not have as pure a heart as Mike Perez. <laughs> and yet, we're running the same direction. By God's grace, we're laying hold of the same thing. And yes, to different degrees. But this is still true. Purity of heart, the kingdom belongs to those with pure hearts. It's funny uh, just to think about, you know, by, by way of illustration, uh, when you talk, when, when jewelers talk about the clarity of a diamond, there's a way they rate that and they associate clarity with how few inclusions and what they call blemishes the diamond has. That's basically internal and external markings that obscure the clarity of the diamond somehow. And the less inclusions on the inside or blemishes on the outside that a diamond has, they call that purity. And as the purity increases because of the diminishment of those impurities, the clarity increases in the diamond, the, the rating. I thought it was just, it was fun to read this, this sentence really from the Gemological Institute of America. They say, if you're trying to determine what is the best clarity for a diamond, remember that no diamond is perfectly pure, but the closer it comes to purity, the better the clarity. Clarity and purity are associated. You have a pure heart, you're a kingdom citizen who will inherit the kingdom, who has actual rights today to something that's going to be, you're going to cash in on one day when God rewards his faithful. You have, you're going to increase in clarity now, just like a diamond. I uh, just want to end our time and just exhorting you with this final question from this final question. How is purity of heart accomplished? We've seen what it is. We know what it is. We know that it's possible. And we see that it is so necessary. Then we need to know how to actually accomplish this. How do we attain to, how do we maintain, if you will, purity of heart? Like I mentioned, it's not, you don't, it's not automatic. You don't roll out of bed with a pure heart and your spouse knows this. Your, your kids can bear witness to this reality. Even when you're given a, a new heart, it's, it's sort of like when you get a new family van, your kids are thinking, that's got new spaces for us to make a mess in. Your new heart's like that. New temptations ready to make a mess of that new heart God's given you. And so it takes work to keep it clean. Let me just give you a few ways that this is accomplished. First of all, by believing. By believing. You can maintain purity of heart by believing. Uh, we're saved by faith, and it is right to also say we are sanctified by faith. And I mean the kind of faith that strives. <laughs> is what we're sanctified by. You're saved by faith alone that doesn't strive, doesn't work, Paul says in Romans 4. But the faith, the same, really the same faith that saves apart from worth, uh, works is the, the same faith that sanctifies by works. <laughs> Takes your effort, doesn't it? You can write down Romans 4:18. And following where Abraham, it says, grew strong in faith because he continued exercising faith in the God who spoke the promises to him. It's the same way with us. We have a God who has spoken 66 books worth of promises to us. All we have to do is read it and believe it. It's your job. And you can have a pure heart by believing the promises of God, all of them. The ones that have been fulfilled, that we still can't see, taste, hold, touch, and the ones that are still future, believe them all the same. 
We can accomplish this by believing. We can also accomplish this by fearing. By fearing. I mean fearing the Lord. This is what Chris put before you last week uh, as he preached Psalm 90. The fear of the Lord will purify your own heart. Why? Because I know who God is and I live in light of who he is. And even when nobody else is around, it doesn't matter a single bit because I am so aware that God still sees and I care what he thinks more than anybody else. Proverbs 16, 6 says this, by loving kindness and truth, iniquity is atoned for and by the fear of Yahweh, one turns away from evil. It's by the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the hinge on which sanctification turns. Purity of heart hinges on fear of the Lord. If you don't fear the Lord, you'll never have purity of heart. If you do fear of the Lord, you can't help but have purity of heart. That's how it works. You, how else is this accomplished? By praying, by praying, by believing, by fearing, and by praying. Psalm 119, 86 ends with this prayer. Help me. Help me. That counts for a prayer. You, you, you wondering what to pray? There you go. Help me. That is the cry of a dependent believer. Pouring out his heart to God in two words. Help me. And we should pray this prayer. If you recognize the immensity of the task of maintaining a pure heart, I don't know about you, but I know the temptations I feel. And I just think, Lord, how in the world? If it's up to me, I am not going to stay faithful. You know, there's enough temptations all around me, advertisements, billboards, riding down the highway, just sin all around, and in me. I don't stand a chance unless supernaturally God preserves me and produces the purity of heart that I can't accomplish for myself on my own. Help me is a good prayer, believer. How else is this accomplished? Fourthly, by preaching. By preaching. That's right. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.5, the goal of our command, the goal of our instruction, exhortation is love from what? A pure heart. Biblical instruction aims to produce purity of heart in the listener so that they will be better lovers of God and his church and others. Biblical preaching aims to sanctify the inner life, aims to help you have purity of heart. And so if there is opportunity for you to hear biblical teaching, if there is an opportunity, and I know I'm preaching to the choir because you're at equipping hour, somebody's going to hear this on the back end who isn't here this, this morning. If you sacrifice biblical teaching, preaching, instruction for other things that are not helping you obtain purity of heart and endure for eternity, you're making a worthless trade. You're making a worthless trade. If you're tired, but there's biblical instruction happening at small group, you need to be there. If there's biblical teaching in 414, and I know there is, and you choose to do other things because you just don't feel like going, that's a bad trade. If you're praying what I just mentioned, help me, God, help me grow, and you're asking people around you to help you, but you don't want to be at equipping hour and you don't want to be at Sunday evening services, stop praying. Stop praying. You have a banquet laid out for you, and you, you would rather sit at the table and go hungry. 
I remember I was sick one time, and my dad told me, if you're not going to do what the doctor says, stop asking for people to pray for you. Okay, (laughs) I'm going to do what the doctor says. (laughs) Avail yourself to the preaching and teaching of God's word whenever it's available. And by doing so, you're proving that you're dependent on God. You're entrusting your soul to him and his means for change. Just a couple others to mention uh, by fellowshipping. By fellowshipping. We already saw this in 2 Timothy 2. Biblical fellowship, too, is intended to purify the heart. You need help? Get alongside people who are doing it, who are running the same direction. Young men who are single, you need help growing in purity of heart. Marry a woman who's doing it. You get real close to a woman who's running the same direction. Don't delay marriage. Don't get more practical than that. Uh, you can write down Hebrews 3, 12 to 13, because the solution in God's mind through this biblical preacher was to avoid hardness of heart, to avoid an unbelieving heart, encourage one another. As long as it's called today. Biblical fellowship, you need biblical fellowship to obtain purity of heart, to maintain purity of heart and run well in the Christian life. And then finally, uh, in addition to all that I've, I've said so far, by striving, by striving. It's hard work, isn't it? It's not automatic. And so don't set your expectations wrongly and just expect ease. It's not too hard. If you're doing all that it requires, then you're only doing just enough. It's not too hard. It's what God intends. And so exert yourself. This is good. You're going to die soon anyway. He wondered, the the patriarchs, they lived almost 200 years old. How in the world did they do it? Heart shepherding all those years by faith, believing the promises. You don't have to do it as long as them. So take heart. (laughs) It's a sprint. (laughs) 80 years right? By strength. (laughs) Let me just encourage you with this quote from, uh, from Ryle on this note of striving. He says, where there is grace, there will be conflict. The believer is a soldier. There is no holiness without warfare. Saved souls will always be found to have fought a fight. And so the best that we can do is, is depend on the Lord to fight well. Let me pray to that end. God, thank you for the hope that you offer us uh, in, in these uh, impossible tasks. We just look at this mountain before us of your standards of holiness, and yet we comfort our own hearts to know that your commandments are not burdensome. Your yoke is easy. It's light. Your burden is light. And so impossible, though it is with us, with man, uh, with you, all things are possible. You saved us uh, against all odds, raised us from the dead spiritually. And so certainly to walk faithfully with you, you are more than able to do far beyond what we ask or think. And in the end, God, to comfort those uh, who love you so that we in the end will see Christ, God in the flesh, face to face. And I pray for all those who believe you here today that you would help us to run the race well, that we might see that day. And any who do not believe you and have yet to entrust their lives to Christ, that you would humble them even now and cause them to to turn to you in humble faith to receive the blessing that you have for those who seek you. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.